good morning good afternoon good evening everyone wherever you are um uh, as usual with these zoom meetings um unless obviously asking a question could you mute your microphone to limit background noise all that good stuff um on behalf of the ethnomusicology reading group and the international council for traditional music thank you all very much for attending the ictm dialogues 2021 panel reading together in a far-reaching community applying decolonization to practice um in a moment we'll turn to the substance of our session but first i'd like to draw your attention to two resources which you can see digitally imposed behind me. Um, the first is the Ethnomusicology Reading Group's website. Um, if you would like to sign up to the group after the session or anything like that, or contact us, you'll find instructions on how to do so in our current reading schedule on that website. The second is a Padlet, which we hope you'll use during this session. Uh, we invite you to submit questions, comments, or reflections to any of our speakers on that Padlet, and you can do so by clicking the plus button that appears under each topic if you haven't used Padlet before. And we'll do our best to address these questions during our two scheduled Q&A sessions. Um, you can access both these resources through either the links that Kate has just pasted in the Zoom uh, in the Zoom chat box, um, and she'll continue to post them as more people join, I'm sure. Or if you prefer to use a mobile device, you can uh, either on my video or Kate's video, you can scan either the Padlet QR code here or the reading group website QR code here. I feel like a weather person. There it is. ERG there. <laughs> um, you can, uh, so either of those works absolutely fine. So with all that practical info out the way, um, I'd like to move on to the first video presentation, uh, which is Ethnomusicology Reading Group Introduction and Issues. And after that, I will introduce our speakers in more detail. So we'd like to begin our session today by thinking about some of the major issues we have encountered in running the Ethnomusicology Reading Group, this small scale grassroots organisation open to participants and scholars around the world. And we want to begin by thinking about these issues with a question. And our question is, why Finland? And specifically, why uh, Finland's Ethnomusicology Journal? And you can see a recent issue on the screen in front of you. Back in January 2018, when our reading group had already been in existence for some 18 months, we turned to this journal uh, to try and think about some issues of decolonising. And in doing so, we made an announcement on our website to our membership body, and we stated the following. The group is now comprised of students and researchers based in different universities, academic systems and countries. To celebrate this diversity, our next block of readings will examine outputs from a multilingual journal, namely the Finnish Society for Ethnomusicology's peer-reviewed open access journal. The reading group sessions may also help support researchers preparing for the 22nd annual symposium for music scholars in Finland at the University of Helsinki. So our actions in choosing this journal and in identifying this as a means for us to celebrate our diversity already, I think, highlight very clearly some of the problems, some of the challenges of undertaking decolonizing work. And what Peter and I want to do in this opening session of our ICTM dialogue session is consider our positionality in relation to challenging the universality of academic outputs by white researchers. But first, we need to understand what exactly is this reading group that we keep referring to. The Ethnomusicology Reading Group is a community of practice comprised of ethnomusicologists of different scholarly levels from around the world. It was created in 2016 with the guiding principle of accessibility for all, uh, but primarily as a way for a small number of distance learning PhD students to keep in contact and prepare for conferences. Uh, however, now we currently have over 185 uh, members on five different continents. There are three main pillars to the reading group that have developed as the reading group has evolved. The first uh, is the weekly reading group itself. Uh, these are chaired discussions, um, Kate and I being the co-chairs, chaired discussions about a variety of different outputs. Um, we, uh, along with the members, set 
guiding questions for these discussions, though these are flexible depending on how the conversations go. Um, the reading lists uh, are based on a certain aim or theme generally per block uh, and are curated by myself and Kate, along with assistance from members, suggestions and senior scholars in those fields. Uh, our regular attendance block and depending on the reading uh, is about five to 15 attendees a week. The second pillar is our study days. Uh, these have started recently. They're an accountability focused workspace for members, similar to a writing retreat. Um, it is a structured day with time at the start for goal setting and creativity and writing warm ups and time at the end for general discussions or feedback on members work, uh, kind of an open space for whatever member requirements are needed. Um, the third is the peer feedback mailing list, which is uh, our most recent endeavor. Uh, members uh, have opted in or can opt in to give feedback on members' work. Uh, members request feedback and submit work to us, which we then distribute to the people on the mailing list who, if they have time, provide comments either directly to the author or anonymously if desired. And outside these kind of three facilitated pillars, um, members often send in questions to be distributed to other members or contact each other to collaborate outside of the group. Um, today, we are principally focusing on the activities of the weekly reading group as this attracts the greatest engagement from our members and is the longest standing pillar of the reading group. <clears throat> um, as the group evolved and uh, Kate and I came to realize uh, somewhat slowly and somewhat uh, kind of naively that as the group had grown from this very small grassroots organization into a much bigger grassroots organization that uh, we had uh, taken on uh, unknowingly a responsibility for um, disseminating knowledge to our members and in essence we were generating curricula for them. So what then do we mean by a curriculum? It might sound a rather simplistic question, but in the context of this decolonising work, it's important to understand how do we grow? How do we nourish a new curriculum? So I want to share with you two extracts from um, an article and I'll provide the citation for you in a moment. But this particular scholar writes that Curriculum represents an official selection that structures knowledge in ways that privilege a particular construction of knowledge and the history of knowledge. And for Peter and I, we came to realize that it was in fact us, two white um, British educated uh, early career researchers who were doing that selecting work and essentially pointing other researchers around the world, often from very different parts of the world to us, um, as to what we consider to be worthy of inclusion on a reading list, which is clearly problematic. Secondly, they write that it's a site, a curriculum is a site for a certain kind of knowledge reproduction that takes place through the misinterpretations of history and the othering of minorities. And of course, for us as ethnomusicologists, perhaps working directly with research participants who are already others, who are who othered, who are already marginalised, uh, this is particularly problematic and for us not reflective of our membership base on five continents. So those quotations come from Michael Peter's uh, 2018 work, Why is my curriculum white? And Peter and I came to recognize that certainly our curricula to date had been white, and that was something that we wanted to challenge. So then how did this fit in to the evolution of the ERG? And here, Peter and I really are thinking about our positionality um, in relation to challenging uh, the universality of outputs from white researchers here? Well, the first sense is tokenism. Uh, we openly acknowledge that our nod to, and I quote, celebrate diversity uh, by using the output from Finland was wholly tokenistic and in no way representative of diversity. Um, it may have been because we wanted to diversify the languages in which we access scholarship and this particular journal published uh, bilingually. But in essence, what we recognized as we evolved um, and as we tried to implement decolonizing work was that we were in fact encountering um, and perhaps even unwittingly contributing to these major issues, tokenism and the um, uncritical attempt 
uh, to work with contemporary scholarship in terms of language and publishing. Perhaps more worryingly though, uh, we came to recognise that we were perhaps guilty of reinscribing colonialism. For example, uh, we created often reading lists from conference programmes and special journal issues with really little or no active curation or critique. So let me give you an example of how we did that. Uh, for two reading blocks of about 10 weeks each, we took prize winners from the Society for Ethnomusicology. So in other words, uh, by taking prize winners, we deemed them uncritically to be synonymous with quality, but also um, appropriate to share with our membership around the world as a marker um, of what good ethnomusicological scholarship would look like. So why did we do this? Well, we think upon reflection that it was a result of our own internal colonisation, uh, even though we ran a decolonising ethnomusicology reading blog. In hindsight, we failed to really engage with the issue sufficiently, in large part due to our own internal colonisation. And really for us, this asks a question, this leads to a question if we, as the co-chairs of a small grassroots organisation with no external funding, one that's open to everyone, if we are facing these issues, then is our discipline and is scholarship more generally beyond repair? As I'm sure everyone here is aware, these issues of particular relevance to ethnomusicologists um, and our study where the people we study and the musics we study are often already dehumanised or, or marginalised. Um, this song released uh, 30 years ago this year in 1991 shows what our interlocutors were saying even at that time. still keep coming like death in taxes to our land to study their feathered freaks with funded money in their hand like a sunday at the zoo the cameras click away taking notes and tape recordings of all the animals that play here come the anthro and had you passed away Since then, uh, ethnomusicologists have devoted time and energy uh, over the past uh, number of years engaging with these issues um, during fieldwork, as the, the, the song kind of highlights, but perhaps less time considering their positionality as scholars once the fieldwork is over and they are, in a way, reintegrated back into traditional academic structures. And this is... Uh, part of the, the idea of a decolonial positionality here described by Mowgli and Cadwell in, in Decolonising the Curriculum Beyond the Surge, uh, published this year. A decolonial positionality, quote, invites reflection on one's own complicity, preconceived notions, and countering norms, behaviour, values, ideology, language, and policies that dehumanise marginalised populations. And definitely for, for Kate and I during the reading group, this was the... Um, as uh, she has mentioned, especially after a work, a block on decolonization, the realization that we were contributing to these things, and even in this small grassroots organization, that we had a much larger role to play than I think either of us thought our organization would um, have in this um, in this work. And so, how do we then go about the process of decolonizing? So Peter and I have given you an overview and we've tried to be candid about where we have encountered difficulties, where we have taken wrong steps or where we wish we had known more uh, at an earlier stage in this process. But in hindsight, uh, what we have done is taken a series of steps. So the first step was to really interrupt uh, this notion of hegemonic forms of knowledge. And the way that we have done that is by including uh, or placing even at the centre of our reading lists um, 
diverse scholarships from multiple geographies of the world. So in other words, in order to interrupt that hegemonic form of knowledge, we have had to remove the particularity of Eurocentric or North American centric also scholarship. And in doing that, what we have done is been fundamentally critical of the centrality of Western discourses within ethnomusicological literature. And in doing so as well, we have better reflected our membership body. As Peter mentioned earlier on, we've got members from five continents and we want to make sure that um, their epistemologies and uh, their perspectives are also reflected in the readings that we set, hence why we actively solicit ideas and suggestions from our membership body. And in doing that, what we're trying to do as a small grassroots organisation is develop counter narratives um, to existing ideas or norms or dominant statements about what ethnomusicological scholarship, but also ethnomusicological communities of practice look like. So if we were to summarise this, what we're trying to do is seek a plurality of scholarly perspectives and epistemologies through curating reading lists that are representative of the diversity of scholarship that exists, but that also reflects um, our very diverse membership body. And so our speakers that will follow will reflect upon how they themselves have gone about this process. Thank you very much. Uh, and to ourselves, I guess, I don't know who I'm thanking really with that. I'd like to um, just very quickly draw your attention, especially to people that have joined uh, later on, that there are two resources that we have available for you throughout this uh, session. The first is the website of the Ethnomusicology Reading Group, um, which uh, you can access through links posted in the chat box or through this wonderful QR code here if you'd like to use a mobile device. And the other one is a Padlet, um, and we encourage you with the Padlet to post any questions, comments, or reflections you have throughout this session, which again, the link to that can be found either in the Zoom chat box or if you prefer to use a mobile device here. So moving on from that first presentation, I'd just like to lay out the kind of structure of the rest of this session. Um, the next presentation and following an uh, interactive musical interlude will be delivered by Karen Bindu and Sajit Vijayan, uh, based in Austria and India respectively, after which will be a 15 minute Q&A session uh, on the video you just saw and on Karen and Sajit's video as well. Uh, questions for that session will be drawn from the Padlet. Um, and also directly from any attendee who wishes to pose a question directly. Following that Q&A, we will see two further contributions back to back. The first being a presentation from my co-chair in the reading group, Kate Walker, and the second as a dialogue between UK-based Hannah Bates and Abel Marcel Calderon Arias, a Cuban musician based in the Netherlands. We will then have a second 15 minute Q&A session, once again, drawing questions from Padlet and directly from attendees. And after that, we'll wrap up. So that's the kind of the, the bullet point list of what's going on. So with that brief introduction concluded, we will turn to Karen and Sajid's presentation before the musical interlude and the first Q&A block. Dear colleagues, we heartily welcome you to our session, Reflections about Research Differences and Collaborations in the South Indian Kudyatam Community. Thanks very much for having us here. Um, we are Sajit Vijay from Kerala Kalamandalam, percussionist, Mirao percussionist, and also actor. And I'm Karen Bindu, social and cultural anthropologist from Austria. I've studied uh, yeah, social and cultural anthropology with focus on music ethnology and uh, all that at the University of Vienna. And I'm also a percussionist. So that's how we met many years ago in 2004 exactly. And how we uh, yeah, had a good connections from the beginning on. What is Kudyatam, what we are talking about? Um, just a short overview. Kudyatam is a ritualistic visual sacrifice. It is existing since a long period. It, um, so parts of it, that means the, the performers and also the instruments are mentioned uh, 2000 years ago in the Tamil epic Chilapatikaram or generally in the Tamil Sangam literature. That means um, the art form Kudyatam traces back uh, a long time ago. 
it is not only an oral history, it is based on written Sanskrit dramas um, derived from the epics Rama, Ramayana and Mahabharata. So uh, these epics are used to, um, yeah, to, to get out some certain acts who are, which are performed in Kudyatam and Kutu performances by certain castes, the Chakyas, the Nangyas, the actresses, and the Nambyas, the percussionists. Here we show you a short impression of a real performance um, recorded in 2019. It is a Nangya Kutu performance, a solo performance for women, and Sajid is one of the drummers sitting behind the actresses on the left side. <laughs> Yeah, um, the drumming itself um, is made in or can be made in three kinds of. It can be done uh, with kriyas, that means uh, what you have seen, the actors and actresses move. The percussionists uh, can play in the same rhythm of their movements. And um, the way they are drumming is based on um, solfege syllabus, vaitari. The drums can also play in various speeds according uh, to, to the mudras and expressions of rasas, emotions. And when there are no drummers on the stage, the Mirau also is improvising. Um, and uh, from these improvisations, more and new art forms are developed, where only drummers play with um, some other different instruments. So all these kind of performances are temple-based art forms. And nowadays, they are also performed at, um, you can say, non-sacred um, stages as well, theater stages and so on. So uh, just a short impression of the Baitaris and the, the Malayalam language. There are many books written in Malayalam, many books written in Sanskrit, many books written in Tamil language. So there's uh, a huge, um, uh, we can say a, a huge um, richness of written literature. And that is where we met in 2004, Kerala Kalamandalam. It's in the center of Kerala. On the left side, you see a Kutambalam. It is a temple theater where um, all performances are done, not only Kudyadam, but also all the other art forms who are taught at the Kalamandalam. And here you see the Mirau department with its present department head, Achutanadam. Here you see Ishwan Uni, that is our teacher, who is retired now, but still very active in writing books and uh, also teaching and performing. That was me sitting in the gallery with um, the other pupils in 2004, 2005 and 2006. So I spent several weeks or months there to, for my research, for my dissertation. Yes, um, now Sajid will talk about the basic situation of the Kudyatam community in Kerala. Well, uh, in, in Kerala, we have a very, very few researchers. Uh, at the same time, we have artists, we have a practical uh, a practitioner, and it's practitioners who, who works with, uh, with this uh, art form. So we, we can say, so we have uh, um, uh, practical researchers uh, in, in, in Kerala or in India, and the theoretical uh, researchers he gets from pastors. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's two types of uh, balancing. Uh, um, it's, it's good, in a way, it's good, uh, because, uh, um, how do you say, because it, uh, 
it's the kind of uh, spreading out of, of this knowledge of this art form, uh, of the idea of this art form. Uh, and I'm I'm not sure we can we can get uh, much more uh, uh, artists from from West. That will be always less uh, because the uh, because there is a big uh, time difference and it's I mean the distance. Uh, people they they have to come here and they have to study here and they have to live here because for this art form. Uh, we are not to, uh, uh, the Westerners can find uh, a proper uh, stage or a proper uh, uh, a performance platform there. Uh, because it, our art forms are temple related and uh, temple. And uh, temple based. That is what he was uh, wanted to talk, to say in the end. Um, I just want to add that researchers from the West are coming mostly from the uh, theater departments, theater science, the indologists, uh, musicologists are really rare because um, the accompaniment, uh, accompaniment uh, music is not regarded uh, such as um, the classical Indian music. So it is not uh, the same, following the same system. Yeah, and um, I asked Sajid uh, in my next well, question um, about archiving, because as I told you, there are lots of uh, books written in uh, about this art form, especially about the, the acts themselves. So there are manuals and, and um, there are palm leaf manuscripts who have been translated by uh, Indologists from Kerala. And um, of course, the, the research methods are really uh, different from, from both. So the, the Western research methods, uh, which get adapted by um, scientists from Kerala, are probably citations, field research, some historical and systematic methods and analysis. And the Indian methods are historical citations reviews, um, and they have uh, descriptive and autobiographic approaches, observations, and of course, also lots of translations. So um, the, the question is how this knowledge gets archived. Uh, knowledge, we, we lost it. Still, it, it, it is only archive and it's archive but not a live form. Mm -hmm. So this can happen yeah. in, in the past, in the, uh, in the next um, years, this can also be happened. And, and are there researchers who are really going to the archives and watching the, the old recordings and, and then recreating them? Is this what yes, you do. You researchers do. Uh, well, the researchers, they should do here yeah, the problem is uh, 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 the researchers and the performers. That is that is the problem. The performers they they can also be researchers, but the problem is uh, how they have to do the research through their performance and uh, just to the uh, just through the archive materials or uh, uh, book based research. So the research, when, uh, when they start a research, uh, if it can produce a live form, yeah. I, I am pointing the same thing what I said before, if, if they can uh, if they can found something or if they can delete something uh, which helps to the, uh, which, which can help the uh, live form of the art, that is the only thing can help the live Live art. Otherwise, uh, as a research material, as a uh, as a theory uh, thing, it can stay somewhere in bookshelf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and um, what I also want to add, a uh, phenomenon that I um, recently discovered, that there are also rare citations from each other. That means um, that Westerners 
uh, we read on rarely um, cite Malayalam books because of the language barrier, and also the opposite um, scientists from Kerala don't um, give citations of Western, um, yeah, Western scientists. So this is also a special um, observation. And um, last but not least, uh, we were talking about our visions of collaboration. As you see here in the pictures, we, we have a long tradition to um, not perform together because I, I don't have any arangeta, any first stage performance. So my time period as a percussionist in Kerala was too short. I was doing more research for that. But uh, what we did since uh, and what we do since a long time, since 2007, is offering lecture demonstrations. It means we are introducing the art form and we, we do some rhythms together. And uh, Sajid also shows movements. So in that way, we keep it alive and uh, make the art form known here in Vienna as well. And I asked Sajid about his vision of, um, yeah, ideal collaboration. For you personally? Uh, so I, I think um, something like what we do. I mean, uh, for, for Westerners, they have limitation to get uh, data from uh, 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 from Kerala, because there is a barrier of language, a barrier of uh, uh, traveling place, uh, understand, uh, and the cultural barrier. There's a lot of barriers. But at the same time, uh, if they include a person, uh, uh, a person from Kerala, so this will be much easier to, to them. So what we do because when we write when you write something something uh, uh, yourself you can you can write at the same time uh, for some works you include me so this is a possibility if uh, if someone do together one person from kerala one person from abroad because they have the uh, the, the westerners they have the team uh, um, the research methodology in mind and uh, um, uh, the, the person who, the Kerala person who can collect the things and get more uh, deep into, into the form. So together, the work will be a, a, very, uh, a very big work, a very big uh, uh, effort and uh, a very big, uh, it can reach the goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, and there is uh, um, uh, there is another possibility is this person, the, the person who worked with this Westerner, he knows what is the, uh, the, the Western method of uh, uh, research and uh, research methodology, then he can give advice to the other. Uh, to the other. So this was um, our final point of uh, the discussion. And we, we, we want to continue with our live performance um, just to show you at the end of our live performance, we want to perform or to play with you together a short passage. And um, this is the rhythmic pattern which uh, we want to follow with your support. So enjoy our demonstration and thanks for attention. Thank you very much, Karen and Sajith. If you'd like to go into the, the musical part. Yes, yes. So welcome to Sajith and he will perform on the Mirao now. Please unmute, don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs>
Thank you so much. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. A lot of clapping. And uh, now we want to invite you. It's just for a short minute. If we have uh, still time, it is just uh, maybe for some seconds. We we invite you to follow by clapping on your on your feet or on your tables the music the rhythmic pattern that you have seen before. So it's like Thank you so, so much for that, Sajith, and, and to both of you for a wonderful presentation as well. So I'd like now to um, open the, the, the floor up to questions. Um, as we said before, we have a Padlet going if you'd like to type out your question and kind of submit it in that form. Um, you can put it in the Zoom chat box if you'd like as well. Um, if you'd like to ask a question using your microphone, uh, you can either use the Zoom little hands up button or if you're not sure how to to get to that on whatever device you're on if you just type an x into the chat box then i will call on you to ask your question as well um so while people are getting some thoughts together there is one question uh, currently in the padlet that says um could you say a little more about the license needed to perform uh karen i think you said you did not receive it does this affect the research process uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, actually, no, it did not research the, the um, research process I, I was into at the time because I wrote my dissertation about the methods of, of drumming education at Kerala Kalamandalam. But of course, if I want to continue as, as an artist and contribute as an artist, artist to Kudyatnam or maybe the, the other art forms which are playing without the actors and actresses then uh, it will affect because uh, without this first stage performance you're not allowed to go on stage and participate in a full performance in india it takes maybe uh, i think i remember three years of study to to join this first stage performance and it is uh, like a like a big uh, thing for for every student because then the teacher will come, the the parents will come, so everybody will be here and and uh, celebrate um, the newborn <laughs> artist who is then allowed to perform on stage. Thank you very much for for answering that. And I have a, a question as well for Sajith as well. In the video, you spoke about the the uh, your kind of ideal collaborative relationship, and you said similar to the one that you and Karen had. How common are those rela research relationships in the community? The kind of the good research relationships. How common are they in the community? 
Oh, you're muted. Sorry, at the moment. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I think it's uh, it's quite uh, quite prior because uh, uh, there is a few few of the foreigners. I mean, I, I mean the uh, the people, the researchers from Western, they they come and they they will have a, a research. Uh, but uh, what we did, uh, Karen and uh, myself, uh, we were quite good friends, and so and we know each other. So uh, she knows uh, the uh, she knows the potential what I can do and uh, I know how I can help. So so uh, together uh, we thought we can we can do uh, we can do something uh, to uh, to make this art form or uh, to make some performance also also make the the form alive. So. So this is this is quite a rare thing. Uh, even if uh, even if some uh, some European or Western uh, researchers when when they came, it's really difficult to find a partner uh, who has the same mannerism. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. That's, that's very interesting. We've got a, a question in the chat uh, to both of you. Karen and Sajith, do you see your research on Kutiatam as decolonial? How have you decolonized your research method? Yeah, that is a, a good question because um, actually um, our situation is like Sajith also mentioned. He's more the, the artist, the performer, and I am the researcher. So. Um, how we decolonize is that together we, we think upon ideas, how we, for example, create an article or how we create a talk like that. So we share our ideas. So ideas are coming from him and from, from my side. And, and this is how we process. But uh, what we don't have, we don't have a, a fixed uh, research goal together until now. So, so we are taking chances uh, who, which are happening, but um, until now we, we have no common research topic that we say in, into that we will we'll do research from both sides with all um, archive work and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is from my side. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have anything to add, Sajid? Yeah, uh, she just said. Uh, so this is this is quite a, a rare thing. What we what we are actually together. Um, uh, if even if someone comes from uh, any any Western country, uh, the the act of the artists, uh, most of the artists, they will not be ready to do something uh, uh, to collaborate with them. Uh, so uh, myself. Uh, and uh, and uh, Karen. Uh, so for us, we felt something we can do something. We are doing something uh, something uh, something not common, something not uh, not easy to to merge. So I think uh, this something uh, this can make something something extra or something something big. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we we're going to move on now to the next set of presentations. If there are any further questions that anyone thinks of, either based on Karen and Saji's presentation or Kate and I's um, initial introduction presentation, please put them up on the Padlet and um, the presenters uh, will comment on them and, and we'll leave that Padlet up after the ICTM is concluded as well. So the next set of presentations is going to be um, uh, firstly um, Kate's presentation and then straight after we will have Hannah and Abel's presentation, or their dialogue should I say. So first up is Kate Walker's, thank you. 
In June 2020, a group of Taiko players announced a program on social media titled Reimagining a New World, Building Practices of Awareness, Activism and Anti-Racism in the Taiko Community. I want to share with you now their post and draw your attention to three significant factors. The first factor is the stated desire to bring about community level change. So you'll note that the program is described as building practices as a Taiko community, in other words, affecting change within it. The second facet that I'd like to draw your attention to is its accessibility. It's designed as a virtual practice, in part reflecting the time, June 2020, but also in turn making it more widely available. And third is the fact that it calls upon the personal experiences of 23 Taiko leaders. In the post, the organisers describe them as drawing from personal and authentic experience. And these Taiko leaders were principally, although not exclusively, Asian Americans. So why then did this programme come about at this time? Well, we need to understand the context from which it emerged. In May 2020, uh, George Floyd was unlawfully murdered and his death, amongst others, sparked uh, Black Lives Matter protests across North America. You can see on the screen in front of you dots representing individual protests between May 25th and July 8th, 2020. Indeed, on June the 6th, some half a million people came out in 550 places across the USA to protest systemic racism and police brutality. Now, these topics, of course, were reflected at the time, prominently in mainstream media. Here, for instance, is the New York Times cover on the day that Reimagining a New World was announced as a program to the Taiko community. There are three separate or discrete uh, stories reflecting police brutality and systemic racism. So, what then? is Reimagining a New World about? How is it described? How is it promoted? For this purpose, I'm going to defer to Michelle Fuji and Karen Young, the two program organizers, and I'll share with you the video that they use to promote the program to Taiko players. It is undeniable to ignore all that is happening at this moment in time. So, we're asking you to join us in a virtual practice to explore and address issues of racism, anti-Blackness, and systemic oppression. I'm inspired by words by Bruce Lee, who said, Under duress, we do not rise to our expectations. We fall to our training level. We know that our training has been based on living in a context that is inequitable and based on a curriculum that is in conflict with creating a just community. So it's time to retrain. We know how to practice. We do know how to practice. And we, as Taiko leaders, players, artists, we already have some powerful tools to reimagine new possibilities, spark radical shift, create change. We also know firsthand the discipline and practice that it takes to make things happen. So join us as we organize this three-part virtual practice, Reimagining a New World, Building Practices of Awareness and Anti-Racism as a Taiko Community. See you then. So one facet in particular stands out from their introduction to reimagining a new world. You might have noticed in this video that they quite clearly articulate just how to bring about that new world. They said that as Taiko leaders, players and artists, we possess powerful tools. It is up to all of us to recontextualize these tools in the framework of practicing anti-racism and building an effective social movement. In other words, uh, players, Taiko players, are equipped with skills musically and socially in order to be able to respond to larger scale social issues in society. So how then can we theorise what's happening here? Well, today I want to call upon the Community Cultural 
development model. This is one that is conceived by Kim Dumphy as part of a typology that theorizes arts participation as a social change model. And within community cultural development, change occurs at a community level as a result of creative social interaction between arts participants. So Lee Higgins, the community music scholar, describes community cultural development and its component parts thus. He says, community acknowledges the participatory the participatory nature, emphasizing collaborations between artists and other community members. Cultural indicates a breadth of activity beyond just art and includes the elements of activism and community organization typically seen as part of non-art social change campaigns. And development suggests the dynamic nature of cultural action with its ambition of conscientization and empowerment. So here, in other words, I'm referring to the community as the community of practice comprised of Taiko players. So how then is this model of community cultural development, this change at the community of practice level reflected in the programme structure? Well, as Michelle Fuji and Karen Young referenced in their introductory video, the programme was comprised of three synchronous sessions held via Zoom. And each one followed the same structure. First, there was an opening plenary which contained guest speakers. Second, there were breakout groups which were led by topic facilitators, all of whom did so voluntarily. And third was a closing plenary that brought together the roughly 100 or so Taiko players and Taiko affiliates from around the world to close each session. What's noteworthy in connection to community cultural development, this notion of bringing about change that might expand beyond uh, what we might reasonably expect in a musical community is the topics, the topics that were led by individual facilitators. Examples include topics focused on white supremacy, on the police, on anti-blackness and anti-racism. And further examples include Orientalism in Taiko, activism practices, the personal politics of Taiko and whiteness and privilege. So what can we deduce from this programme structure? Well, I want to suggest to you that it immediately acknowledges inequity. And this is a two-part inequity that this program seems to be designed to challenge. The first is an acknowledgement of wider societal inequity and members of the Taiko community being in a position to challenge that inequity. But the second, as referenced by topics like Orientalism in Taiko and the personal politics of Taiko, is that inequity, in fact, affects the ongoing practices within the Taiko community. So in other words, the Taiko community might, through this program, affect change beyond the Taiko community, but also within the Taiko community. Now, who exactly is doing this changing or this activism work, this community cultural development work? Well, if we look at the findings from the Taiko census conducted by the Taiko Community Alliance in 2016, we're presented with a really varying uh, Taiko community depending on the geography concerned. In 2016, I was heavily involved in the design and analysis of the data. In the United Kingdom, we gathered detailed demographic and Taiko practice information from some 85 Taiko players. And in the USA and Canada, we received data from some 1,300 Taiko players. And as you can see, were presented with very different cohorts. In the United Kingdom, Taiko players are disproportionately white, 92% white compared to 86% of a white population in the United Kingdom in general. It's also majority female. In contrast, in the USA and Canada, some 60% of Taiko players self-identified as either Asian or Asian mixed race. So white players, form a minority of Taiko players in the USA and Canada. They form some 30% of the population, at least among respondents. Notably, however, as well, we've got 
uh, a majority of female players, close to two thirds. And I'm bringing in this sort of intersectional lens on the demographics, even though Reimagining a New World is clearly a race-based program, uh, because as we'll see, the gender factor influences certain behaviours. Now, given that in the USA and Canada, the geography from which Reimagining a New World emerged as a program, given that we've got diversity, uh, particularly in terms of race within the Taiko community, one might reasonably expect uh, for issues around diversity and inclusion to be prominent within the Taiko community. And indeed, they are many groups uh, make statements or uh, reflect these values within their mission statements. However, in practice, the Tycho census tells us something quite different. So, for instance, let's look at some of the inequities at play. So, from the TCA Tycho census, we can tell that in North America, men might make up 35% of the Tycho community, but 50% of men self-identify as teachers. Similarly, um, whilst men uh, make up the make up, well, 50%, excuse me, of men may self-identify as teachers, uh, fewer men are likely to be unpaid. In other words, female teachers are more likely to be unpaid compared to their male counterparts. And finally, men are 50% more likely than women to derive a significant proportion of their income from Tycho. Now, you might reasonably say that the difference in these data points is not significant, but when we look at major events or major opportunities for leadership and visibility within the community, we see a really different story. Here, I want to turn to an example of the North American Tycho Conference, a biennial event held in North America that typically attracts upwards of 500 Tycho players from around the world. So let's look at the participant profile from 2017. In 2017, while men formed some 36% of participants, they in fact formed 68% of workshop leaders, workshop leaders being paid to deliver hands-on practical Tycho workshops at this event. So in contrast, we see the inverse for female participants. So 63% of females were participants, but only 32% of them, of workshop leaders, were female. So some really significant uh, differences suggesting from a data point of view that diversity may be a pronounced statement, but actually in reality, um, it doesn't always play out. So... As ethnomusicologists, we are interested in how the social manifests in the musical outputs that we examine. And in one of the plenary sessions for Reimagining a New World, we were introduced to a song titled There Will Be Joy from the Activist Songbook. The Activist Songbook is a collaborative effort by two musicians, and they have jointly written and composed uh, more than 50 songs on the basis of interviews with members of the Asian American community and allies of the Asian American movement. On their website, they describe it thus, that they explore how civil rights organizing and music in intersect to inspire action and sustain the fight towards equity. So what was There Will Be Joy all about? Well, it was inspired by PG and Roy Hirabayashi, the founders um, of the San Jose Taiko Group, one of the most prominent Taiko groups in North America, arguably, and based in um, Northern California, in, in San Jose. And they also, in the Reimagining a New World program, served as two of the program facilitators. So what I want to suggest to you is that some of these issues around wider inequity um, actually emerge through this song, in the, which was recorded and shared with us in the context of the George Floyd murders and the ongoing um, division, the ongoing uh, protests that took place across North America um, in the spring and summer of 2020. So let's have a listen 
uh, to this song. Yo! of this song, There Will Be Joy, inspired by Roy and PJ Hirabayashi, the co-founders of San Jose Taiko. And what I want to suggest to you is that it is a musical manifestation of community cultural development. This notion that change occurs at a community level as a result of creative social interaction between arts participants. In other words, it reflects um, the values held, but also the change that is desired to be seen. But more widely, I suggest that this song reflects a structure of whiteness, that these, um, the lyricists in particular, and some of the um, musicians that are seen on the screen have experienced. So let's unpick this a little bit, what I mean by this. Later on in this song, I played you a short excerpt, the lyrics are thus, in music, we can be uncivil. And I suggest that this is really setting out to challenge a framework of whiteness. By whiteness, I'm referring to Ruth Frankenberg's um, framework of whiteness. And I want to compare it against some of the lyrics from There Will Be Joy. So the first element of whiteness is a location of structural advantage of race privilege. And an example of that acknowledged in the song, There Will Be Joy, are the opening lyrics by the soloist. The turning point for me was to see Chris and Joanne, Asian Americans, singing our story. In other words, that's an atypical experience, referencing for Asian Americans a structural disadvantage. The second point uh, of whiteness by Ruth Frankenberg it is a standpoint, a place from which white people look at ourselves, at others, and at society. Later on in this song, there's a solo by a male singer, and he sings, can't make any trouble or speak of our interment, be silent. So he's referencing here the standpoint from which white people perceive Asian Americans, referring specifically to the wide scale interment of Japanese American citizens, particularly and including American citizens during World War II, the perception that they are perceived as silent or should be perceived as silent. 
And the third element of whiteness, according to Frankenberg, is that it refers to a set of cultural practices that are usually unmarked and unnamed. Again, lyrics later from this song, they are righteous and they are loud. I thought, how can they do that? How can Asian Americans be righteous and loud through the practice of their taiko? You'll notice that I haven't commented upon the efficacy of the community cultural development model. And one of the reasons for that is firstly, the scale of the program and the number of people that it reached. But secondly, because of the community guidelines to respect the confidentiality and the stories that were exchanged within the space of the meetings. Nevertheless, I do want to draw your attention uh, to some of the ethnographic reflections that I encountered, both as a participant, but also as someone who has undertaken extensive research with this community, particularly for my recently completed PhD project. So ultimately, what I want to suggest to you is that this, um, the materials I've presented to you, both the programme uh, and the music that forms part of the programme, There Will Be Joy, reflect a musical and programmatic pushback against whiteness. But there are wider factors at play. For the first part, I want to suggest that in order for community cultural development to take place, inequalities first have to be acknowledged within musical communities. We've certainly done this from the lens of gender, and many of my colleagues, Taiko scholars, have examined the role of race extensively within the Taiko community. But nevertheless, I suggest there is an absence of quantitative data that allows us to explore uh, race and how that might affect disadvantage from an objective standpoint. So I hope uh, that in the future, this can form part of my research agenda. The second point, though, um, is with reference to who is undertaking this heavy, heavy work. So community cultural development with its ambition of conscientization and empowerment, I suggest runs the risk of reproducing the existing order. In other words, we are reliant upon BIPOC members of our community to educate others and to respond to wider scale social issues um, by addressing them within the Taiko community and considering the role of Taiko players in affecting change within our wider societies. In the case of the North American Taiko Conference, for example, we saw that men were grossly overrepresented in reference to their wider position in the Taiko community. And that was when we were aware of these issues. As Bordeaux says, every established order tends to produce the naturalization of its own arbitrariness. Um, and so my concern is that may be the case here with attempts to challenge systemic racism within and beyond the Taiko community. And lastly, I want to finish with a somewhat more hopeful note, um, and that is these programme organisers and all of the facilitators interrupted the status quo and drew attention to these issues that were reflected in wider society and which many, many of the participants experienced in their own lives and drew attention to them through the lens of the Taiko community. By interrupting that status quo, I suggest they took a key first step for challenging the reproduction of inequity as it occurs within a musical community. I thank you very much for your attention and will gladly welcome questions in the break. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. <laughs> So just to give a bit of an introduction, um, Abel and I met when I traveled to Cuba in 2003, 2004. I had traveled to Cuba to learn local popular music and had been informed by the administrators at the local schools that I could learn pop Cuban popular music there. Now, when I arrived, I discovered there was no course and there wasn't anyone within the school system who could teach me. So I was obliged, like many students, foreign students who had gone there for the same reason to enroll in Spanish classes and some classical music courses so as to not break the conditions of my visa. As a result, I did what a lot, a lot of other foreign students did and looked for a local teacher who could teach me privately. There were a lot of local students who were already playing 
popular music and jazz at a really high level in spite of being very young. And Abel was one of the most prodigious amongst them. And that's how we met. Later on, some years later, when I returned to do the fieldwork for my thesis, this problem of popular music not being taught at an equal level within the conservatoire to Western classical music was an ongoing issue, and it came up a lot in the interviews. Broadly speaking, classical music is taught through musical literacy in the school system, and musicians have been learning popular music orally from one another within the community and through professional working situations, all of which in Cuba is referred to as the street or in Spanish, la calle. So I've been looking in my research about this Eurocentric expansionism of the conservatoire, the repeated reification of its aesthetic values and how these are being contested by popular musicians in iterative fashions in their daily lives. One of my jobs as a researcher is to understand this situation better and to represent their negotiations and everyday resistance whilst not getting into tr anyone into trouble for potentially perceived dissenting views. Since that time, Abel and I have been having an ongoing dialogue about this and a range of much broader issues. Um, I personally feel like I've learned a lot from our ongoing dialogue and in terms of applying decolonization to practice, we will talk about it both with respect to my applying it to engaging with the field as an outsider and also what Abel feels needs to change as an insider and as a Cuban educated in Cuba, but now living outside of Cuba. So before we talk more specifically about dialogue, can you tell me um, a little bit how you wanted to clarify your position in terms of insider and outsiderness? Um, I must say that I have been both. You um, mentioned in your introduction now when you were talking, our education is mainly uh, classical. So in, in that sense, uh, I would like to call myself an outsider. And now by being insider um, in this balance of literacy and orality that exists in Cuba, not only because the music we're learning at the street is also because our culture is extremely influenced by, by the African culture, which is mainly oral. You realize how in our country, I will quote my aunt with that, that is a kind of a perfect balance between humanism and paganism, you know, this kind of la calle and institution. And I believe that both are necessary. Okay. So what are the um, erased narratives that for you um, have been obscured by more official or other privileged narratives that you think need to be given light to them? Sure, definitely. For example, uh, Rosa Marchetti, she has a, a blog that is called Desmemoriados. She has rescued a lot of the narrative that actually uh, institutional musicology have not taken care um, and through her I discovered for example the piano player that her name is Numidia Vajant and that for me was uh, it changed it changed completely my my vision of of the of the Cuban music one of them is Mario Bausa it's a name that now we wish you just recently start to mention uh, one another one of them is Celia Cruz, for example that in the case of a musician or someone who is in touch can know but if you don't adding a place that 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 name is not mentioned or or you don't listen because it's censored in the radio that name get lost at least for me that's how i feel it so there have been more recent examples of censorship and erasure than those that were specifically um purely to, down to the sort of colonial yeah i mean it's definitely in i mean it's, it's i you, we have been talking about that and i think that it's time to, to ask you a question but but answer you to that music is how i also help me to define my identity so when you have this erased narrative or or or, or no erases sometimes narratives that are there but they have been manipulated for many reasons that uh, i i would not i i think this will be too long to talk um they they in, they have an impact at, at least at me personally. I'm talking about from my point of view. Uh, yeah, it's, it's through the the dialogue is necessary, and through dialogue is how you get uh, to to know those things. And especially if you practice the, the dialogue, two different opinions from a rational point of view, and you try to leave the emotion behind, and you try to find you know uh, something there. Yeah, I think for for me, if if I think about dialogue. Um, 
like there were definitely things that people speak about in mm-hmm. Cuba that aren't written down. So dialogue, like literally verbal dialogue in its most kind of raw form is something that is absolutely necessary um, in order to, you know, uncover like a wide range of erased narratives, whether yeah. they're, you know, the fact that, you know, Western, um, Western culture it has been privileged um, and, and whiteness still is unraced because you have the word Cuban and then you have the word Afro-Cuban, but I've never heard Whoa. of Hispano-Cuban or Euro-Cuban. I know, I know you have Criollo, but the thing is, is that in terms of the, even in terms of the language, we can, we can see this sort of like normative um, creation of of whiteness, even even though Cuba is a Caribbean country, so that's another problem that we're sort of looking at, isn't it? Whoa. But in terms, of, in, when I look at dialogue for me, you mm-hmm. know, and how I'm engaging with the field, um, and also as somebody, you know, a white woman coming from a colonial country, um, you know, I feel that decolonizing is something that is an iterative process for all of us. We have mm-hmm. to, you know, constantly review what we what we are doing mm-hmm. and constantly reflect on it um but also in terms of actually dealing with the field and having a longer dialogues with people mm-hmm. who have connections in the field you know you get to know people better you have greater depth of, of the mm-hmm. relationship a more human level and i think it guards against this um problem of extractivism that historically has been a problem for ethnomusicology um, we also navigate some of the tricky aspects of relationships when we're in um, in them in a longer term, mm-hmm. confront inequalities that we experience as individuals within relationship with, with one another. You know, you and I have both sort of lived in Cuba, lived outside in Cuba. You know, we've changed financial Yeah, situations. yeah, 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 yeah. That, 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 I mean, the dialogue and especially. some of the colonization that we we both have from... No, it, it's, so, it's so big. Country. It's so big. For example, you mentioned something now. I mean, despite the the status or something, but when in the in the process of the decolonization, the privilege, the Africa, and the, the, there's something that I would like to add that and recently I mentioned a lot when you was talking about the musician of La Calle, and there is a saying in Cuba that I believe nowadays that is, oh my God, that's so I don't know if it's colonial or how to classify it, but we say I would say it in Spanish first. Mira que bien toca y es de la calle. So yeah. it's like look, it look how good he played and he is from the street. So like it, it like they're surprised. Yeah, uh, and this has gone. Imagine to into which level, until which extent that that a music that mainly born from the from the la calle and, and even more funny, like in happening in many countries in Latin America that was marginalized at the beginning because it was from the street. Now suddenly it, it takes a completely different connotation, and, and in the case of Cuba, in this Eurocentric narrative that you're talking about, there is one a really interesting example that actually I was talking today with a friend of mine, uh, Sandra, Sandra Borges, and she uh, she's a violin player. She made her thesis about Jose White. Jose White he wrote a piece that is called La Bella Cubana. And that piece was taught by us by a Russian woman, not for a Cuban uh, teacher. But also funny enough is that Jose White, he studied in Paris. He studied in the conservatory. And even something that I found out here that I, for example, I never get to know in, in Cuba, at least, or I didn't research, I didn't mean to say it like that, is that he also taught UNESCO. And um, Hannah, like uh, in, the, in our dialogues, I would like to ask you, what for you, what has been the, let's say, how listening has been, has been a tool for you in, in the importance of applying, I mean, this decolonization to practice when you get to know two people and how, what has been your experience, especially in, in, the, in this last uh, research experience that you, you mentioned before? Yeah, so I, I had a, I mean, I had a few experiences, but this actually brings me to something that I would like to kind of open up as a point mm-hmm. of discussion, maybe to the other panelists, maybe to some of the audience members, um, to really just ask this question of how can listening function as a decolonial exercise or an application of decolonization to practice? Mm-hmm. Because I think, you know, when we are talking about erased narratives, 
um, giving, paying witness to somebody's testimony is like, it's the first step. It's an essential step that we all should be taking. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, when I first went into the field, I wasn't a great listener. And I, don't, and I think that listening is something that we under um, appreciate, um, possibly uh, quite broadly, you know, within European culture, within, within academia, you know, um, and I, you know, I noticed myself interrupting people when I listened back on the interviews, but it wasn't, it's not just about that, because that's something that, you know, you couldn't quite easily fix, but it was really just about when you really, really listen, that actually how much more is being communicated, mm-hmm. um, perhaps than we sometimes realize when we really, really, really pay attention to people. But really that the bearing um, bearing witness to people's testimony is is got to be one of the most fundamental first steps in um, countering er- the erasure of narratives. It's something that I want to mention because it's just it's, it's happened recently um, and make me really happy actually that uh, just recently uh, uh, Silvio Rodriguez, which is a think a writer from Cuba, he was doing a conference in ISA, in the Instituto Superior de Arte, Higher Institute, Institute of Arts, in the University of Arts in, in Havana. And he mentioned something that, that through those interviews that I did, that I believe that you also did, and we have talked also about that. He mentioned something about, he said that Fernando Ortiz was full, was cheap, no, no, was not giving to him some uh, correct information. Oh, yeah, uh, he, they, 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 they didn't, they kind of misled him. Yeah, um, I, I listened that in several contexts, even in, in that interview that is in YouTube. I, I, uh, I can invite people to watch it. He, he mentioned that. Um, and I was happy because the, this opened a door to, to actually to that erased narrative to came up, to rewrite it again, to, to, to check it. That this doesn't mean that the work that has been done is not uh, relevant. It's not, not at all. It's just the reinterpretation of it, or sometimes certain kind of parameters uh, that the device, I mean, despite being diverse, sometimes we can also be inclusive, a bit more inclusive. Imagine in Cuba between Matanzas and Havana, uh, they have a toque in, you know, of the Bata. That is what I did my research here. And in the two different areas, they call it different. They're playing the same, but they call it different. So when you yeah, have this kind of conflict, is is yeah. at least for me that I didn't grow up on it. I'm, in that moment, I'm an outsider, for example, talking about insider. In that moment, I consider myself an outsider. I I I don't know into which extent I can confirm something. I actually found that both are valid, and, and they are um, uh, beautiful, marvelous, and, and and should be contemplated because at the end, to finish that, I will quote Carl Jung that he said. As far as someone has a strong hypothesis, only fools do not contemplate it. Yeah, yeah. and definitely it, it kind of it kind of it's a, a testimony of the of the pluralities. Yeah, exactly. of, of, of within a nation state, and I think this idea of outsider and insider is probably problem- problematic because the the nation state itself is not co- cohesive and coherent. So um, I would like to just refer again um, the panel and the audience to that question of like, um, how can we work on our listening practices? How can we include listening yeah. in uh, decolonial um, activism mm-hmm. as researchers and as creative people um, in the field? So, and also in connection with each other. So thanks so much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. This was lovely. Thank you very much to to Kate and to Hannah and Abel for those presentations. There's a few applause hands coming through on the Zoom, which is lovely. Um, So once again, um, I'd like to open up to the next um, Q&A segment. Uh, We do have a couple of questions on the Padlet, so I will I will go through those. But if you would like to uh, ask your question in person, uh, as it were, in in voice, uh, then um, either put a hand up using the little Zoom hands up button or uh, whack an X in the Zoom chat box. That'd be fantastic. So the first question uh, that I saw come up on the Padlet is to Kate uh, and is entitled The Movement and the Pandemic. 
it seems that there will be joy was recorded via zoom or a similar platform can you elaborate on how the pandemic has influenced this movement if it has yes so uh, the activist songbook is an initiative that kicked off in 2018 with a series of interviews uh, with asian american uh, asian americans uh, or members of the Asian, or supporters, excuse me, of the Asian American movement. And those interviews were conducted throughout 2018 with the plan to launch the activist songbook itself, the performances and the resources in 2020. So as you rightly pointed out, all of the songs were recorded and uh, put together uh, via Zoom, hence why we have this kind of recording. So the pandemic influenced it uh, in that sense. Um, but I think nevertheless, it's shown us uh, the potential of this platform because the musicians that you saw as part of this performance, some of whom I know personally, uh, are from very disparate geographies. So uh, it allowed a, a certain accessibility that might not have otherwise uh, been possible. Thank you very much for that, Kate. Um, and then a question to uh, Abel and Hannah. Uh, what might, quote, listening training for graduate students or early career researchers look like? Hi. Yeah, Abel just said, go first. Um, yeah, I, I suppose one of the things that um, I maybe want to contextualise about why listening was important to me, which is not a direct answer to the question, but I'll go on to answer it, um, was that, you know, I think I went into the field with an agenda, you know, and some expectations. And I think that that probably happens to a lot of us when we go into the field. Um, but that was definitely a, a barrier for me to appreciate um, a lot of the, the, the stuff that was, was coming up. I sort of experienced a frustration um, that I wasn't getting the data that I wanted and that I wasn't getting the data that I expected. And I think there's, you know, um, for my own personal sort of experience of being in the field, um, I almost felt like I needed a little warning sign to just sort of say, just uh, just go with what comes up and see what that leads you. Because that is something that, <clears throat> you know, has brought me some of the most precious um, sort of valuable testimonies that I, I, got, I got to experience. Um, and I think I think this idea of witnessing and um, yeah, witnessing other people's testimonies and really what it means to do that, um, I think is something that is misunderstood. And um, I think in terms of, I don't know, I have to talk about my own society, that we're not always able to be present with other people's realities. Um, because we're busy or because we're distracted or you know all of these sorts of things they they all sort of um come in come into play quite a lot and i think that listening is labor you know um you know as as women we do that a lot um the being a sounding board those sorts of things that sort of labor and i think that the capacity of expanding this idea of witnessing and um, doing the labour of listening, if we expand it so that everybody starts to sort of understand how to just be and allow somebody um, to to express themselves and, and for us to, to bear witness to that, I think that's a very, very powerful thing. In terms of how it would look like in training, um, I think, I think so, perhaps to some degree it's about interviewing skills. Um, but I also think that it's, I think it is a lot more profound and I think it is a lot more, um, for me, certainly it was, it was actually quite an emotional thing, um, to go through, um, and to experience people opening up their lives to me, um, and, and what I had to sort of do to hold that, um, and to be a conduit or, you know, to further down the line, look into representation of those, those stories. Um, I think that we all sort of need a bit of work around the emotional side of it, perhaps. Um, I probably haven't answered the question in 
very, very, a lot of detail in terms of the logistics of that. Um, but I think that's something that we can work on. And I think I'll, I will sort of go back to sort of decolonizing is an iterative process. We will make errors. We have to review our errors and do better next time. And I think if we have this constant cycle of go, doing better next time and doing better next time and doing better next time, we will move in the right direction. So that's me. Thank you very much, Hannah. Abel, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, I, I must say that in, in that process of uh, only add a bit of what Hannah was talking about, the, the fact that normally we have a plan, we have an agenda uh, that we're at, uh, going there. And also we have our expectation that that expectation in a way that kind of connected to emotions, I must say. Um, in, in the training of listening, sometimes I think that uh, something that can be done uh, despite that is, is a, a bit more, um, uh, maybe approach uh, the interview with more like a transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach. When you use that kind of decentralization, where you leave your emotions behind, you try to actually try to accurate, receive um, and get that message correctly. Um, and um, and glossary and, um, and in the case it, it would hurt a lot, especially in, in the case of of the Caribbean, especially Cuban uh, culture, that in the last thirty years the the vocabulary evolved a lot, and sometimes you can get confusions because what just to put you an example, and, and I finish with this is the the best one. You know, there's a lot of always debates when people talk about clave, Cuban clave this three, two, two, three. The funny part, it's only something really simple that you not know, three, two is what people represent that we have three stroke in one part of the box. But in Cuba, when we count, we count one, two, one, two, three. So basically the counting is completely shifted. So everything, so this kind of things, uh, so, so subtle, things but they they kind of affect the the a, a lot uh, later on the input with the kind of a, a margin of error either sign from the scientist point of view or or such you name it this could be so the training i think that could be focused a lot in in, in to to learn a, a bit of glossary of it and also to control the expectation uh, and be open to to see things from another point of view uh, and and and, and see where it can lead you, because that sometimes can be beautiful. At, at least for me, what is important is the process rather than the outcome. So listening helps a lot about that. Thank you, Abel, that's fantastic. Thanks. I'm just gonna uh, see if any other questions crop up in the chat box or on the Padlet or by raising your hands or any of the other question asking methods that we've developed in this digital age of, of Zoom conversations. Uh, um, one has just come in in the Zoom chat. Uh, Kate, could you comment about how the Tyco community challenges whiteness through performance? Mm, thank you very much. That's a terrific question. Mm. Um, and it's it's a question that's the answer to which is not static, because what we have seen in the aftermath of George Floyd's death and subsequent efforts by players to mobilise, so I gave you one programme example uh, reimagining a new world, but there are others too. Um, the, the difficulty with that is that, um, as I mentioned, it's overwhelmingly uh, BIPOC players who are doing the mobilising, doing the organising, and essentially trying to shift understanding. What's interesting to me, having now worked with this community for six or seven years, is that there's a really clear focus on gender, but there seems to be, from my perspective as a, as a UK trained uh, taiko player and academic, there seems to be a hesitance to really tackle the issue of race head on, in part because I think this is a majority minority community. So as I mentioned, only 30% of taiko players in North America are white. So whereas we have collaborative compositions that directly tackle the issue of gender within the Taiko community and challenge some of the um, 
disparities that I referenced in my presentation about who gets to teach, who gets to lead, we are not so much seeing such an, such an explicit challenge against some of the um, racial structures that, that do exist within Tycho. As I mentioned in my presentation, I would really hope to include in my research agenda a clearer focus on race uh, beyond the framework of activism. So there are some outstanding Tycho scholars, including uh, Deborah Wong, for example, who's, who have done extraordinary work looking at the role of Tycho uh, in Asian American activism. My question then becomes, OK, it's used as a tool for activism, but what happens um, from an intersectional perspective as well, but what happens in terms of how that affects practice? So to come back to your question, I can't really answer it expressly other than to say this seems to be evolving. Other uh, identity characteristics are more prevalently focused on, but I hope to include it in my research agenda because it's certainly worthy of exploration. Thank you very much, Kate. I will see if anything else comes through in the next couple of minutes. And if not, we will go towards our closing remarks, frantically refreshing all the different web pages. Um, I think then if Kate, when you get a second, if you could whack that last slide up, that'd be fantastic. And we'll move on to our, our closing remarks. Brilliant. So the, the kind of closing remarks here are that the presentations and conversations that you've seen today show how the issues raised in reading group sessions, things like research and research, academics links to non-academics, the university and its relationship with the community and positionality, all these issues, how they can affect research and decolonization efforts by researchers and their interlocutors alike. However, what we'd like to highlight in our closing remarks here is how the reverse is also true and indeed necessary, how our members work reflexively informs the growth and development of the reading group as a grassroots organisation, which can be shown in our action points that we have planned going forward. So first of all um, is a focus on recruitment, particularly in the Global South. Um, Kate and I realised that uh, with our focus on curricula and knowledge dissemination, uh, suddenly had the, the realisation that most of our advertising were going into uh, Facebook groups and BFE mailing list and, and these kind of very standard still playing into these hegemonic structures. Um, and you can see this um, uh, the ideas behind this as well in Karen and Sajith's presentation earlier, experiences of researchers and this false dichotomy that uh, that develops of Western as researcher and non-Westerner as musician. Um, one of the ways we hope to, to focus on this recruitment is by leveraging existing networks by contacting the ICTM's national and regional representatives. So um, if you are a liaison officer and are listening today, you might recently expect an email from us fairly soon uh, about doing that. Um, secondly, as a community of practice, uh, we hope to further capitalise on the strength of our membership by creating spaces to enable scholarly support. As we mentioned in our initial presentation, the reading group has uh, started doing study days and um, peer feedback uh, initiatives as well. Um, and in this way, we can continue in a constant dialogue with our members and and develop this community of practice and dialogue as uh, said with Hannah and Abel's presentation and this idea of listening is, is incredibly important. We hope that will help continue that within the uh, reading group. And thirdly and finally to bring up here is the uh, is our desire to draw attention to the potential of grassroots initiatives for advancing equity and inclusion within our discipline. Um, as Kate's Tycho presentation showed, the, the potential of grassroots organisations is, is absolutely massive. And um, as part of this aim, we have submitted a proposal to the conference of another major disciplinary body. Um, and while ironically, that means we are promoting this grassroots approach within dominant hegemonic structures, we hope that by doing this, we can encourage conversations and encourage dialogue within those structures, which I think is, is uh, an important kind of point of attack, as it were. Um, 
as noted here, we keep using this phrase community of practice, and uh, this is the, the definition here that you all I'm sure are aware of communities of practice are groups of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do. And, and this, importantly, learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. Um, the reading group exists as an organization that started five years ago as a way for distance learning students to keep in contact. Um, three or four, if I remember rightly and now finds itself engaging with responsibilities for curricula and knowledge dissemination and various other important themes and, and issues that could not be expected at the outset of the, the creation of this organization. Um, its development has shown that even for small unfunded initiatives such as ours, treating the organization as its own organism almost can and indeed should uh, the, the group can and indeed should, sorry, develop fluidly, iteratively and reflexively. And this is important to ensure growth towards equity and de decolonization. Um, through these action points that are up on the screen currently and our own continual reflexivity, we hope to further develop our community of practice grounded in the principle of accessibility for all. And we do indeed invite you to join us there as well. Um, there is a QR code on the screen currently for the bibliography for all the different presentations that you've seen today. And also our Gmail address there in case you would like to contact us uh, for anything, absolutely anything at all. Thank you very, very much for coming along and thank you for your attention. Thank you for your organization, Peter and Kate. Huh? There was a lot of work to do it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And a huge thank you to the ICTM for, for having us as well. It's been fantastic. Um, we will be leaving the Padlet up as well, if there's anything anyone else would like to comment on. Um, and you can comment on other people's questions. It's like a little discussion thing. So feel free to do that. And um, yes, uh, I think that uh, is absolutely everything. Um, I'm just double checking the Zoom chat to make sure I haven't forgotten anything, but I think that's about it. We will post the links in the chat one last time, I think, just to make sure everyone's got those. Thank you very much indeed.